We just felt like we were banging our heads against a brick wall. There was absolutely no one there. I was a nervous wreck when I was help at work. Us all help I never him. knew when I was going to get another call from my daughter saying my mum tried to. His voice on the again. phone was. Well, it just didn't sound mm. like him. It was flat. They said they couldn't do anything to help no unless emotion. she actually made an appointment herself. And that just wasn't going to happen. The first time I thought there was really thought there was something wrong with my son was um, halfway through his first term at university. He phoned home and his voice sounded different. Oh, hi, Jake. Yeah, look. I was just, I was, I just needed to speak to you. But I just needed to speak to you about some things, you know. I'm, not, I'm not doing too good here. Man. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. To begin with, I thought perhaps he was just tired, but then he started saying these strange things. He said that nobody liked him, and it could hear what they were thinking about him. And he told me there was writing on the walls at his halls of residence that was all in code and written by people that hated him. You know, they're, they're out in the window now, they're, they're all they're out there now, they're hiding behind bushes and everything, and they're all staring at me, I can, I can see them out there now, like, you know. I suggested that you go and talk to someone about it, but he didn't want to do that. I didn't really know what to do. I tried to rationalise what was going on, thinking that perhaps it was just the stress of being away from home, and the pressure of his studies getting to him, and that maybe this was all part of him adjusting to his new life. But obviously I was really worried and couldn't stop thinking about him. So in the end, I decided to go up and visit him. And when I saw him, he just looked so different. His face was different, almost static. I decided I couldn't leave him there, and I brought him home with me. I thought once we had him at home, then maybe he'd start to feel better. But his behaviour just got more and more bizarre. He used to sleep all day, and then he was up most of the night. I suppose some would say that isn't necessarily unusual for a young man of his age, but it was everything else. He used to stand in front of the mirror for hours, just staring. And when we went into town, he said that he could hear people shouting at him. One day I found him at the bedroom window and he was staring down into the garden. He said there were people just behind the fence. He could hear them talking planning out how they were going to kill him. I tried to persuade him to go and see our GP, um, but he, uh, he wouldn't have it, and so I went anyway, and uh, the GP said uh, he couldn't do anything unless Jake came to see him, but um, he wouldn't do that. I asked him for a home visit, you know, he could come to see Jake at home, because Jake was at home in his room, and he said, no, that was out of the question. I mean, what are you supposed to say when your son is standing there in front of you in great distress, telling you that there are people with guns hiding in the shed who want to kill him? I thought it through and came to the conclusion that the best thing to do was to acknowledge that this was what he was experiencing, but actually it wasn't real which it turned out was the right thing to do. There was one particularly awful night when Jake was really distressed and he was tearing at his clothes and saying that he hated himself. I was really worried, so I phoned the local overnight emergency line. But they couldn't help unless he was putting himself or others in danger. Oh, please. Isn't there anything you can do? What am I supposed to do? Oh, yeah, I don't know what to do. All of this was putting a huge strain on the family. And my husband didn't know quite how to handle what was going on. And our other children were scared of Jake and used to lock themselves in their rooms. We, um, I, I got in touch with a local mental health hospital and they sent round a, a mental health nurse and, um, well, after her visit, we got uh, Jake an, an appointment with a psychiatrist. Okay. By this point, I begin to realise that he was able to put on this sort of front of normality. So I arranged to go and see the psychiatrist myself after one of Jake's appointments. But I didn't really feel like she was listening to me. And. Uh, um, he spends all his time in his room. 
and he's a teenager. Yeah. Well, yes, yes, but he's he's not the the young man who went away to university. To this day, Jake's never taken any medication, and he still hasn't been diagnosed. He's living in his own flat these days. It hasn't been easy, and he's needed a lot of support to get there. On a good day, he's able to get up and go out into town, maybe meet up with a friend or do the shopping, and that'll wipe him out for the rest of the day. That's okay, but it's not much of a life, is it? It feels like a bereavement, um, like we've lost him, and he's been replaced by a stranger. I don't know how I'd have got through the, everything that's happened in the last few years uh, if it hadn't been for the carer's support group. Um, a friend mentioned it to me and when I heard the word carer, automatically assumed it wasn't for me. Um, I've always thought of carers as people who were looking after somebody with a, a physical illness or a disability. Never thought of myself as a carer. The group meet every week and I don't go to every session but it's just good to be able to talk things through with uh, people who are having similar experiences. And it's, it's good to know that myself and my family aren't alone in having to deal with experiences like this. <laughs>